we are stepping into the last section of our series on the missional life. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about stewardship a bit today and what that looks like. And so as I was preparing uh, this week and for this topic, uh, it reminded me of my two youngest kids. Uh, they love their stuffed animals. My two youngest, they love their stuffed animals very, very much. And they have friends also that love their stuffed animals too. And so there are times, you know, when they get a stuffed animal from their friend to look after, uh, and they absolutely love this stuffed animal that they get to look after. And so their friend will pass them a stuffed animal, they get to look after it. And so uh, this stuffed animal becomes the most important stuffed animal in the world. And it becomes the most important thing in the world to them at that moment too. And it's even more important than mom and dad. They care more about this stuffed animal they receive from their friend than they do about their mom or dad. And so all their stuffed animals, maybe that they've even owned, uh, they become unimportant to them. It's like, oh, whatever. You know, they got this swath of stuffed animals on their bed, but this one that they got from their friend to look after, it's so important to them. And so this stuffed animal never leaves their sight. It's wrapped in a blanket. You know, it's taken for walks. It receives the best care. Therefore, the rest of the house doesn't get any care from them. And so their rooms look like trash, but that stuffed animal is pristine. And so it looks like it is brand spanking new. And so at some point, though, they give that stuffed animal back to their friend. And they tell stories of what they did with that stuffed animal to their friend and who it hung out with. You know what? Usually the stuffed animal then has a friend that goes back with the, you know what, the one that they get they were looking after. And as I thought about this sequence of events, the question that went through my mind was, why do they care so much about this stuffed animal that isn't even theirs? Why do they care? Like, this is unbelievable to me. Uh, and so and they go above and beyond to look after it. And in my mind, I'm thinking, listen, let's just like, just don't wreck it, the goal number one. And so keep it in a corner, put it in your drawer, I don't know, and like um, bury it in the backyard and then we'll take it out. I know when it's time to go back. Uh, and then we'll give it back in a week. But they show the stuffed animal like a good time with providing it optimal care. They, again, they're showing other friends. They're telling them about the stuffed animal. And so why do, this, why do they do this if it's not even theirs? Why? Why do they do this? And the reason they care so much is because of the person who gave it to them. They care deeply about this stuffed animal because they were entrusted with it by a close friend, by somebody. And it's like, you know, it shows a friendship too. It's like, wow, you're giving me a stuffed animal. You're trusting me with this. We must be best friends then. And so they recognize the person who gave them this stuffed animal. It's important to them. It's important to them. And they want to utilize and show that care for the person by how they treat uh, what their friend gave to them. They're showing actually care to their friend by how they're treating the stuffed animal. And so I believe this story exemplifies this topic of stewardship and giving. See, a good theology of stewardship begins with the premise that everything uh, belongs to God. All that we are, all that we have, all that there is belongs to Him. And so this is how my kids treat their friends' stuffed animals. It's like, wow, you've given this to me, you've entrusted me this, with this? belongs to you, well, I'm going to treat this really well, and I'm going to do good things with this. And so they recognize it isn't theirs, and they're thankful for what's given to them for the time being, and they make sure that they steward that time very, very well. The time that they have with that stuff, family, they steward it well. They look after it. They don't hide it to protect it, as sometimes we might do with things that we've received, but we, they use the time with that animal well and give account to their friends of what they did. And that's exactly what irony is what will happen in our life too. Jesus has given us resources. He's given us time. He's given us money. He's given us things that he's entrusted us with. And we recognize what he has given to us is actually not ours at all. And at one point we will stand before God and say, hey, this is actually what I did though with what you gave me. Just as my kids stand before their friends with their stuffed animal and they say, hey, this is what I did with what you gave me and you entrusted me with. And maybe if they knew well, they're not going to get a stuffed animal in their future. No, it's like, wow, you took off its ear and its leg. And so it's like, well, <clears throat> you're never seeing a stuffed animal again. So 
We either hide it though, or we use it for ourselves, whatever we're given. Or we maximize what was given to us, realizing what was given to us isn't ours. It's not ours, what we've been given. And we give account to Jesus saying, this is what I did with what you gave me. What was never rightfully mine, what was always yours, but this is what I did with it, because you've entrusted me with it. Listen, you're never going to look at a stuffed animal the same. And so I'm not sure if you just buy one, put it on your mantle, and you'll always remember the stewardship giving talk. And so, um, <clears throat> or if you already sleep with one, which probably 90% of you do. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you'll now look at that stuffy the same. I have a stuffed animal, but <clears throat> it's a story for another day. Just as <clears throat> my kids gave, uh, just as my kids do when they give their friends back their stuffed animal, this is what they did with the stuffed animal they gave. This is what we're going to do with Jesus. Not stuffed animals, but with our life. And while this sounds obvious, it's exactly the opposite of what the world would have us believe. See, according to the world, what I have has nothing to do with God. It's mine. I earned it. I bought it. I paid for it. I own it. Even if it was given to me or I inherited it, it's still mine. And I will see and do what I see fit with it. And as far as the world is concerned, I can do anything I want that belongs to me as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. I can hoard it or share it, save it or spend it, invest it or give it away. It doesn't matter. It's entirely up to me. Now, this is how contrary that thought is to how the Bible teaches us on how we're supposed to live. According to the Bible, it says this, the earth is Yahweh's with its fullness, the world and those who dwell there within. It also says this, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says Yahweh's of armies in Haggai 2.8. And it even says, for every animal of the forest is mine and the living livestock on a thousand hills. It's mine in Psalms 50.10. Now, have you ever taken inventory of all your possessions? You might call it spring cleaning. I'm not sure however it looks in your house. Every year we find ourselves going through the great purge in our home. And so where we walk around, we look, what do we need? Like, how does this room look like this? It's usually Jude's room that's like, wow, he should be on an episode of Hoarders. And so, <clears throat> and so we have to go in there and you know he's crying. We have to take things away. And so, but what, what do we need and what don't we need is the question, really. And every year I'm amazed by what we accumulate in our home. Like, how do I have all this stuff in my house? Like, what's going on? And it's amazing over all this time how abstract those things are. How actually sometimes those things don't they even mean anything. I, why do I even have this? And there's other things that, you know, that are more abstract, like stocks and investments and bank accounts, you know, that we look at and stuff like that. But two things run through my mind during this time. Listen, I, I only need to purchase what we actually need. And all that I actually have here, I actually need to do some changing here. But how can I use it uh, for the kingdom of God better? Because it's not God. It's, it's not mine. It's God's. We need a constant understanding that I'm a steward. I'm not an owner. I'm a steward, I'm not an owner. And there's so much in Scripture that reminds us of this. It says in Job 41.11, everything under heaven belongs to me. In 1 Corinthians 10.26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And it says this in Leviticus 25.23, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine. And you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. See, God still retains the title deed of everything. It is all still His. And those who live in the lands, we do so as tenants to this land. This isn't our home space, but this is God's. He's created it. He's entrusted it with us. How are we going to look after it? How are we going to steward this life well? And when they failed to steward it as he wished, he took things away from them. Now, I've got kids. I've got some teenagers. And so we've got a couple teenagers now that... One in particular who is very good at just leaving clothes on the floor after he changes. And so, and, you know, we've talked about this. Hey, listen, you can't be doing this. Like, the, it needs to look better. You know, people walk by, they see the room and stuff like that. Listen, we're going to take it all if you don't do anything about that. So you've ever had that happen to you? Have your parents ever taken anything away from your room? At one point, my dad was throwing things out of my brother's room. And so he was like, you're keeping it a mess. You don't need this anymore. Literally, I had to walk, you know, and put my body up against, you know, at the stairwell as a dresser came flying down. And so, um, but we're now in the space where like, 
listen, you're not stewarding what's been given to you well. And so I'm taking your clothes. And so we took his clothes. We put it into our room. He was left with, you know what, just, you know what, a very tight shirt and some old shorts that he had to, had to wear for a day. And we're like, listen, I'm glad that you're thin. And so like, you're just going to have to wear this. And so we took it because we just reminded him, listen, this has been given to you. This is what we've asked. You're not looking after this well. This is a reminder. You need to take af- look after yourself. Steward what has been given to you well. And look after the clothes that we g- have given you, what we've bought you. Put them away. Put them in the laundry hamper. This is, so this is a principle that we teach as parents. Listen, if you're not looking after something, we're going to have to take it. Now, and God reminds us of this. He says, you are not your own. You are bought at a price which means that we are his servants. This life that we've been given, we've been given to serve and to steward well. It's later in Luke's gospel that Jesus encountered another wealthy man. He encounters a wealthy man who he called the rich young ruler. And so this rich young ruler had great possessions. He wanted to follow Jesus, but then Jesus gave him some things that he had to do. And he was like, that's actually too much for me to do. I cannot do that. His great possessions were the barrier for him to follow Jesus. Ken Hughes, he says this, How we handle our money has everything to do with how we orient on Jesus. The rich young ruler chose his wealth over Jesus, but for a man named Zacchaeus, meeting the Messiah loosened his hold on his material possessions. And this is the story of Zacchaeus. Luke 19, 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus experienced Jesus, experienced the life that Jesus has called him to live and said, this is what I am asking of you. Experience freedom that the Jesus gave. And he says, I orient everything in my life unto you now. And here Zacchaeus is saying, listen, if I've ripped anybody off, I'll pay them back four times more. And here the rich young ruler is like, Jesus asked him to do one small thing and he just can't do it. There's a very intentional theology of generosity in the Gospel of Luke. And the point is this, is that generosity is a sign of a regenerate soul, of somebody who's saying, hey, something's changed within my heart. And Zacchaeus, he experienced this, and he modeled it for us. And as Christians, our grip should loosen on material things and should be tight on Christ. And we should see that all that we have as a resource to be used by Jesus and to be given unto him, to be given back to him. Hugh says this, he says, there's no such thing as a Christian Scrooge. Some people are like, that's just the way I am. I'm just a grumpy old person. Like, we may have some Scrooges who claim to be Christians, but I don't think you can claim to really know Christ and be a stingy person. See, the gospel, it opens our souls. It's the big thing. But with it, it should open our hands. It should open our hands too. And this is why we're talking about this in the missional life. There's a section in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 4, where Paul, uh, he goes and sees these believers in Macedonia who are extremely generous with everything uh, that they have, even though they were quite poor. And this is what it says. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond on their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And so picture this. Picture going down town Kelowna. Listen, I take my son down to Elk Stadium a couple times a week, and we always intentionally go past Tent City along the way. Tent City is now a bit hidden a lot of the way, but Tent City is back by the old BC Tree Fruits Packing Center back there. And so we drive by. Now, imagine you're dri- even walking past Tent City. They know you're a believer, and now you've led them to Christ. And so 
They've accepted him. They're so impacted by what they've received in the message of Jesus that they know that they are meant to give. And say, they say this to you, listen, I don't have much, but take what I have and give it to somebody who needs it more than me. Imagine that. The poorest of poor people that you would see, and they are coming up to you saying, take what I have and give it to those who need it more than me. That's what's happening here in the Macedonian churches. These people don't have much at all. They, had don't, they have very, very little to their name, but they're so impacted and moved by Jesus. They know they're meant to give of their resources, of their time, and of what they actually have unto Christ. And Paul's like, they have not very much, but they're saying, listen, take it and go and share and help those who need it more than me. Can we give like that? Can we even change our perception like that? That's what the Macedonian believers were like. And Paul says they were like this, not because of anything that they had done, but because of the grace that God had given them. They had experienced Jesus in a mighty powerful way. They could not help but to give everything unto him. Francis Chan, I don't know if you know Francis Chan. Uh, years ago, during a trip to Africa, when he witnessed people living in extreme poverty, poverty, <clears throat> he met and prayed for a little girl in Ethiopia who was dying of starvation. She miraculously she survived this. But Chan came home from that trip, and he asked his wife this, if they could sell their house so they could have more money to give away. And she agreed, and they did it. Oh, that was really hard, and so... <laughs> Um, and that didn't stop there. They kept giving generously, said Sham. And this is what happened on the other side. They kept getting happier. And we think about our world, and right, people who have, 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 like, they have so much. But we think maybe how that corresponds to their happiness, their joy. It's quite the opposite, really, isn't it? And then Chan told God that if God made him rich, he would li keep living at the same level that they were currently living and continue giving his extra money away. The next year, he made a million dollars because of a book he had written and was told that he would likely see millions and millions more. So he signed all the royalties of the books to a nonprofit. And he and his wife continued to practice generosity with their finances. And he said this, that's why I feel like we're the happiest people in the world. Totally change on how he stewarded the things that we had. Listen, they're not ours. We can't take them to heaven. Whatever as our bank account rises, great, but it's not going in with you to heaven. It gets lower. Amen. That's where I'm at. Four kids. Hallelujah. It's, uh, it's going to continue. doesn't matter. I'm investing. We're investing. Our prayer should be to have sight like Zacchaeus and generosity like the Macedonians. To see like Zacchaeus does, helping those in need, and to have the generosity of the Macedonians. Even though I don't have much, I give it all. <clears throat> That's the first premise of a good theology of stewardship. And the second is, although there are many motivations for us to be good stewards, the best and most lasting motivation is gratitude. Giving to others because you're thankful for what God has given to you. Scripture says this, we love him because he first loved us. Well, the same holds true for our giving, how we give of our time, our resources. We give because God first gave us so much. So stewardship flows out of love. It's going to pop up here, hopefully. What? It's like really far behind. Oh, wow. I'm like super far behind. Don't worry, guys. Stewardship flows out of love. And so that's what I want to say. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he have, have eternal life. This is where it starts. And then he calls us to do likewise in the greatest commandment, to live like that. Ephesians 5.2 says, And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So you cannot... 
Here we go. I'm going to get there. Nope. Wow, I'm behind. I'm ahead. Okay, don't worry. I'm, I just had surgery, and so I'm just going to use that excuse. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. You cannot give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And so what that means is this. You can give without loving. How many of you... Oh, okay. Paying your taxes. You know, you, you know, hopefully everybody raises their hands, but um, this is not to expose anybody. But you pay your taxes, right? I, I have to give and pay your taxes. Uh, do I love it? No. No, everyone's shaking their head. That's like, yeah, people are like, yeah, I do not love that. That's, you're right, this stinks. And so, um, see, I, so I have to give. I have to give. I'm not loving it. But you cannot love without giving. In my relationship, let's say, with my wife, I love her immensely. I give of my time, my resources, and money to, for this relationship because I love it. I love her. It doesn't matter. I'll make the time. I'll carve it out. I'll stay up late to have conversations with her. You know, if we, you know, I, I know we need to go out. Maybe we don't have the money. That's okay. It's worth it. And so this, this relationship's worth it. I'm going to trust that I'm pouring into something that will actually, you know, God sees, God says he'll bless it. And then we'll, you know what? And we'll trust that there's something happens on the other side there. So do we love Christ? Do we... If we do then, and we are supposed to mimic him, then does our life mimic his love for the world and how we live this life and how we give our resources, our time, and our energy? Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. That's a cool quote. You want to be defined by what you've done, right? By what you've given. When our home sold, uh, when uh, we were moving here, we had a house in Eston, Saskatchewan, small town, Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, it's, we bought it from a missionary friend, and he was very gracious. And, uh, you know, I, there's a whole story to that, but he, he sold it at a nice price for us. And we were just like, you know what? When we sell this home, we want to give back. We just want to give back. Because, you know, we were blessed, so we want to bless back into, you know what? Uh, whatever is next after this home, after we sell it. So we put money into it, we fixed it up, and, you know, we made a good equity out of it. So it came time, though. The call was for us to come to Lake Country, Saskat or Saskatchewan. Ooh, there's no Lake Country, Saskatchewan, so <clears throat> it's not, there's one lake. And so, um, yeah, this, Kim said they have the most lakes, so they're not as nice. But anyways... This isn't about Saskatchewan versus BC. <laughs> um, Lake Country, which at that time was the fastest growing whatever place in Canada and for purchasing homes and stuff like that. And so we moved here, it's taken the step. We didn't have a home. And so we, our home didn't even sell actually when we came here. And uh, we knew we were supposed to come here. And so we came, got a rental, and then our home sold. And then there was a window where we had to buy a home, but then also, uh, <clears throat> yeah, buy a home, which is really a big thing. And so, and so here we are, we have this money. And you know what? We could have been like, I need to hoard this money because I have to, I'm looking at the markets. I'm afraid, you know, a little bit afraid, like scared. You know, I can't sleep at night. Lots of sweat happening. And so like Kim and I just staring at each other because we don't know what to say sometimes because we're a bit nervous about the market and what's going to take place. We're thinking, where are we going to live? We don't know. And you know what? We still knew we had to give though. And so we still earmarked and we gave a portion of that money to a nonprofit to a missions organization, actually. And we trusted God. And listen, it worked out. Found a home. You know, we've been there for five years. And you know what? It was a, another amazing opportunity and deal. God looked after. There's a story behind that. But listen, if we continue to choose to steward things well, and to invest well into the kingdom of God, I guarantee that he'll look after you. Just as he looked after us. Proverbs 11.25 says this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Acts 20.35 says this, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And we as Christians, and I've said this before, we as Christians and as the church want to be known as the most generous people on the planet. 
if they're like, those people are the most generous, those people are the most generous, and no, we don't talk, don't talk about Christians, we've done something wrong. We need to be known as the most generous, giving, heartfelt people. See, the heart of Christ's mission was putting others first. And the heart of generosity is about thinking about others before yourself. And so Jesus is the model for, Jesus' generosity is the model for our own. His generosity is the model that we are meant to live by. And he sees the map on how we're meant to live. This is what it means to live a gospel-centered life, a missional life. I put first what's most important to Jesus over than what I think is the most important. All of a Christian's life is lived in response to the gospel. 2 Corinthians 8 9, where Paul gives, you know what? That's the most extensive uh, instruction on generosity. He tells the Corinthian believers that ultimately they should think about how much Jesus has given up for them, and then they should respond accordingly. He's like, that's the level. So think about what Jesus did for you. If you're, you know, really wondering, like, what should I do? How should I live my life? What should I give? And think about Christ as your, your mark. And then whatever you think about him, that should be the way that you respond in your generosity and, and the way you live your life. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. He didn't merely give a portion of his life. He gave 100% of his life. And that is our responsibility too. Not just a portion, not just 10% and go out by our own ways, but to offer 100% back to him. So where would you be without Jesus? I got a good answer. At exactly the same place people in this world or maybe without you. See, people can't be saved until they hear about the gospel. And it's only through our stewardship of our time, generosity, giving, and going that people can hear about it. And this is the principle of you reap what you sow. This is just not, you know, a principle that people have said throughout the world, but this is a biblical principle, reaping and sowing. Have you seen Rocky III? Have you seen Rocky III? Rocky, he's become the world champ. You know, he's beaten Apollo Creed. He has started to enjoy a pretty lavish lifestyle, you know, because he's pretty cool. He's pretty popular now. Meanwhile, there's this new star in the background, Kluberling, Mr. T, probably the coolest guy ever to walk the planet Earth next to Jesus. Uh, and so, but Kluber, he's mean. He's hungry. And so the movie toggles between Kluber and his intense training lifestyle and Rocky's lazy wine and cheese lifestyle. You know, he's showing he's prim and proper now. He's going, he's, he's doing his own thing with, you know, with the rich people. And so they, when they meet up to fight, Kluber absolutely pulverizes Rocky. Sorry to ruin the movie for you. And then I'm going to ruin it even more. Mickey dies. And so um, the trainer dies. And so no one can figure out why he got, you know, totally pulverized. But movie watchers, they know why. Balboa has sown a life of laziness, and that is harvested in the ring now. He was in training. Kluber's putting in the time. He's investing. He's sowing. And he's going to reap what he's sown. And then, of course, the rest of the movie goes on. Rocky trains hard, does his one-arm push-ups, drinks his eggs raw, and stuff like that. And it illustrates this important principle. You always reap what you sow. And Paul talks about this in Galatians. Taking a test without studying. I, this, I came home one time really upset, showed him with, and I said, Mom, like, hey, I failed this test. And she was like, what happened? And I said, listen, I don't know what happened. She said, I trusted in God that I would do a good job. I was practicing what you teach me, Mom. And so um, I was exercising my faith in him that he would help me, help me remember, you know, what the stuff that was said in class and blah, 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 whatnot. And then she asked me, Jeremy, did you study? And I was like, well, no. Like, I mean... <laughs> I'm, I'm beautiful and awesome. And so, like, I don't need to study. And I just said, I just trusted Jesus would take the wheel, and he would look after me. I literally said that before the song came out. And so um, I said he would guide my hand to the right box and open my mind to remember the lectures, even though I didn't really pay to the, attention to them, but maybe in my subconscious, Jesus would unlock something. And I was trusting in, in that with him. And then she began to talk to me. Hey, listen, Jeremy, you're only going to put out what you put in. Or you're only going to get out what you put in. That you will reap what you sow. And if you study, you will for sure do better than when you don't study. 
And so Galatians 6, 7, 9, it talks about this. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to their flesh, uh, to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, at first, it sounds like Paul is contradicting what he has taught us everywhere else in Galatians. You know what? Paul has taught us that the gospel is, you know, that God gives us not what we deserve, but righteousness that Christ earned for us, that he gives us as a gift all throughout Galatians. That's what Paul talks about. But then almost here, it feels like he's introducing a principle of karma at the end, that the good you will do will come back on you. And so, so, go, so, so it's not like he's saying now, so good karma, so, so good karma, so you can reap good karma later. But that's the wrong way to read this. Paul is simply reminding us that we all know to be true a principle God has built into the very fabric of the whole universe. What you sow, you will reap. If you put something into the ground and you look after it and you hope and you water it, you're going to hopefully reap a harvest. But if you put nothing in the ground, you can't magically expect 17,000 tomatoes. I love how Anne Stanley puts it. He said, we must realize that Paul doesn't say here, or we must realize what Paul doesn't say here. He doesn't say people reap what they sow unless they ask for forgiveness. See, forgiveness doesn't erase what you've sown. And I've run into this all the time as a pastor, he said. Someone comes to me and says, Andy, I'm doing my best. And I have to say, I'm glad you're doing your best now. But for five years, you, did your, you didn't do your best. That was sowing. Now you're reaping from those years. And doing your best now doesn't erase all the sowing you did then. So if you choose to catch a home on fire today, you leave here, and you're like, you know what? I like fire. And uh, you're just like, I think I want to catch something on fire. So you choose to catch a home on fire. You're, you're going to get in trouble for it today. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you knew that, but uh, heads up. You're, there's going to be consequences to that. You'll have those consequences for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and so on and so forth. You might feel really bad on Wednesday, though. You're like, oh, man, I really shouldn't have caught that house on fire. Hopefully you feel bad Monday, but uh, maybe it takes for you to Wednesday to feel bad that you've caught a house on fire. And you ask for forgiveness. You choose to do good, and maybe you offer to build that person a home. But you still live in the reality of your decision, and might slash probably will end up in jail or with some other severe consequences from the town of Lake Country. You see, there is a distinction between forgiveness of sins and the consequences of sins. You can get forgiveness for your sins, but you can't unsin. Even when God forgives us, our actions have consequences. And so what you sow, you will always reap. The harvest is limited to the planting. And so Tim Keller goes so far to call this an absolute principle in Scripture. He says, it's what underlines actually the whole book's, book of Proverbs. And there's at least 66 places in the Bible where this principle is stated. And it reads like this. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. If someone rolls a stone, it will roll back on them. The wicked person earns an empty wage. If you get rich off injustice or exploita exploitation, you won't ultimately be satisfied. But the one who sows righteousness reaps a lasting reward. Proverbs 22, 8 says, He who sows wickedness reaps trouble. All of Proverbs talks about the sowing and reaping. What we pour in, we'll actually get back. And Paul, he shares, there's two ways you're either going to pour in. You're going to pour in and sow for the spirit or the flesh. Sowing by the Spirit means living generously and giving generously of your time, your resources, and your effort. Sowing in the flesh means that you give to the desires of your body more than you give to the Spirit. You can only harvest what you plant. God wants to, we want God to make something happen, and listen, He can. We're not limiting Him. But as we read throughout all of Scripture, Scripture tells us thing is God has come to redeem us. But the second thing that Scripture tells us is that He's actually come to work with us. He's come to work with us. You see it all throughout the Old Testament, and you see it in the New Testament. He doesn't call us to be on our own, but He calls us, He wants to work with us. He wants to partner with us. Of course He can do it. He's God. But he chooses to use us still and to be with us and to have us part of the journey. 
he also he wants to work with us. And we can't expect something if we don't invest ourselves. And so if we're not investing, if we're not actually putting in the actual resources, time, and effort, we can't expect miraculously something back. Listen, you're like, well, I'm limiting. God means that I'm limiting God. No, God will still work and do his thing and pursue. But actually, we're limiting the work of God through us. And that is the big thing he wants to do, is he wants to work through us and teach us. And one of the clearest pictures of multiplication occurs in John 6, when Jesus is standing before a crowd of 15,000 hungry people. And Philip, he says this, that 2,000 denarii is what it actually would take to feed all these people, which is a six-month wage, right? That's how much they would need to feed all those people, to buy the food to feed these people. And on top of that, even if they had all that money, there wasn't even enough resources laying around for them to do it, to buy that much bread. So he takes a little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish, a Hebrew Happy Meal. Let's we'll call it that. <clears throat> so a Levitical Lunchable for those who like Lunchables. And so, and Jesus took it, he blessed it, and he distributed it to the, th- the disciples. And they gave it away, John explains. It multiplied to the point where there wasn't even enough food to feed every person in the crowd until they were full. And even at that moment, they had enough. They had leftovers, 12 baskets overflowing. There's two things you should take away from that. It can only be multiplied if it is blessed. And that blessing occurs when you actually place it into the hands of Jesus. Listen, if you got a business, or even in your own personal financial life, if you're like, Jesus, I give my business, my life unto you, and you're just trusting him to do something to work, great, great space to be. But there actually has to be a physical contribution to that. There has to be. Words are great, and I tell my kids words are great all the time. Listen, I want you to say sorry. I want you to tell me you love me. But what speaks louder to me is when you show it to me. And this scripture talks about that. They had only a little bit. And they're like, well, Jesus, this is what I have. I give unto you. And then Jesus goes. He takes what's tangibly been given to him, and he blesses it, and he multiplies it. So I'm not sure what that looks like for your business or for your personal life, for your giving or for your time, you know, as you spend, you know, with your resources in your day. We will constantly see throughout the Gospels that Jesus will multiply the things given to him. Bread, fish, talents, disciples. He's in the business of multiplying, but you have to give it to him. You have to physically give him something. You have to physically make an effort to say, Jesus, I'm doing this and take that step. Oh, that hurt. And so, um, and then Jesus, I trust you now that I've made that step. Generosity is an invitation for God to infuse blessing. I'll invite the worship team to come on up, and we're just going to close now. You might be thinking, wow, he talked really long for being hurt. And so I did. I didn't want to sit down because then I felt like I'd be longer. And so it can only be multiplied if you give it away. One guy I was reading said, technically, the miracle, you know, it it didn't happen in Jesus' hands in saying this. First, the disciples, they gathered it. They took what was given. They handed it to Jesus. He then blessed it. And then Jesus handed it back to the disciples. And then they saw the miracle then take place after Jesus had given it back to the disciples. And they just started distributing it. So it wasn't that Jesus was distributing it. It was the disciples that were distributing it. But after they gave it to Jesus, and they said, here, this is what we have. He blessed it, and he multiplied it. Then he gave it back to them, and then they saw the miracle take place. I think that's the big challenge for our personal lives right now. Jesus, I give this to you. Like, give him something. Do something tangible. It has to be tangible. It has to be a physical thing. And then see what he does with it after. And this leads to the last two points. We reap more than we sow. So when we sow, we reap more harvest for our master. And we reap after we sow. So we can only harvest if we persevere. We can only, you know what, reap after we've actually sowed something in. 
So let's put something in. Do something is the call. Change something within your life. Ask the Lord this. And I want to close with this. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully, oops, will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Listen, the challenge as you wrestle with this sermon is, listen, don't do it because I said so. Scripture says, however you live your life, he wants you to do it with joy, out of the abundance of your heart. If you begrudgingly do it, listen, great. You made the step also, but I want you to ask the Lord, what are you calling me to do? And then trust in Him in that step. And so the challenge is this. Take inventory of your life and ask Him, am I sowing sparingly or bountifully? Am I sowing sparingly in my business, in my in my family, into my uh, in my church, into my work, or am I or am I sowing bountifully into those things? And then let Him lead you and guide you. Then ask Him, Lord, what do you want me to do next? What tangible thing do you want me to do next? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Lord, that you freely gave unto us and you call us to freely give a life unto you. And Lord, that looks like in everything that we do. And Lord, some people say, well, then you don't, you want us to be robots. You, you want us to just be your people who just do what you do and stuff like that. I want to do what I do. Lord, the beauty is that Scripture tells us as we give of our life, we find it to you. Lord, every, you're the creator. You created us. You know how we were made. And so only if we freely give unto you, actually, we fully understand the person that we were made. And we live this joyful, happy life, Lord. And I've, the best decision I've made is following you, Lord. You've led me far and away to different spaces, away from my family, away from, you know, things that are comfortable to me, Lord. But I would not change one single thing because I find it joy. Lord, I've unlocked, you've unlocked things within my life that I never probably would not able to experience or be unlocked if I just stayed put in my own little circle. Lord, choosing you is the best decision. Choosing to follow you and to give everything unto you is the best decision. And Lord, when I choose to live a life that looks like yours, man, I am full of happiness. I feel like I've connected to what you, your purpose is for us in this world. So Lord, help us to live a life like that. Lord, to be missional in everything that we do. Lord, to evaluate our lives and ask the tough questions. So Lord, thank you. Lord, that you show us the life and we want to steward this life well. Let us not live in guilt. Oh, man, I've done so many things wrong. Lord, the beauty is you say, okay, let's forgive. Let's move forward. Let's do this. Lord, you want us to continue moving forward with you. So we thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care. In your name.